Thank you so much for joining us tonight to share your insights. Oh, so nice, so nice. I had a chance, I just want to tell the audience, I had a chance to meet Rugby Straw last year, right when Netflix debuted. And we had a beautiful party in the city, and it was a smashing success. And I had a little bit of an introduction to your work, but I shouldn't put the idea into my head that I should invite you to chat a little bit about dating, because it looks like you pack a punch and you've been given divine inspiration and a lot of us luck and a lot of success. So tonight I thought, first, perhaps you'll take us into your background, uh, a little bit about the journey of life and how, and seg into how you got into this work. And then maybe I'll throw some scenarios by you and you'll tell me how you deal with it. And we'll just have some fun together. So maybe you start out and tell us about where you grew up and, you know, your formation and how you became such a very special Jew. I'll tell you what was amazing to me about your offer is that we're two men in a woman's world. That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> there are not there are not many men that are doing what we're doing. That's right. I feel like a chameleon. <laughs> right. People, I, I was uh, just at an event with an elite with Elisa and she and, and somebody asked from the audience, asked me, how do you feel being a man in a woman's world? And I said, I really haven't really thought about it so much. And that's why when you're, and then that day, your offer came and I said, you know what? There's another man in a woman's world. Let's figure it out. Let's talk together and see what it's all like and we can commiserate. <laughs> that's true. That's, I don't know if it was by design or by, just, we were led here. The Ultimately, we all have a tikkun, like the Rebbe told us, is to take care of Klali Israel. So if this is what he has in store for us. <laughs> so be it. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely never asked for this. There's no question. I didn't wake up one day and say, oh, my greatest dream in life is to get involved and be a matchmaker, a dating coach. I never, ever thought this was going to be my life. Ditto. <laughs> Not in a million years. But David Amelach said, Otherwise, man, otherwise, man pl plans and Hashem laughs. Exactly. And God laughs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you give me chizik. <laughs> you give me tremendous fortification. It's, Thank you. It's, Thank you. Very, uh, it's very hard. It's thankless work. Yeah. Completely thankless. I was walking down the street about a week ago, and I see this wonderful couple, and they're... They're there. I'm like, oh, it's so nice that you're both uh, still together. It's great. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, so uh, I turned to him with a j just joking. I'm like, did you pop the question? He's like, actually, we're married for a year and a half. I'm like, thanks for inviting me to the wedding. Wow. Zip again. That hurts. And but it, that's comes with, it comes with the territory. Comes I learned to become my I don't have, I don't so, have any ill feelings towards them, Chas I don't, I don't feel any bad but it's amazing how you have singles who they they'll do anything to get your attention when they're single and right. all of a sudden you set them up and they're in a happy relationship and not only forget about your attention they totally forgotten right right to, it's to, like to, archived and deleted still contrast that the next day hashem yisbarach sent me a gift that only after that i was i, I have to say i was a little depressed i was a little bit like down on like you know, I spend so much time. I'm setting up singles. I'm it's very hard work. It's it's it, brutal. And, it, <laughs> <That's> brutal. <laughs> and the next day, I get an invitation. A couple comes to my door with an invitation, and it says, "With gratitude to Hashem Yisbarach and Rabbi Yisrael Bernath." Wow! On so Hashem was looking out for you. That's fantastic. You see, your <laughs> bunch Shalom didn't want you to have any kind of bad feeling. He's he took care of you. That's amazing. I've never seen anything like that. I mean, I, wow. I, can, I can show you the invitation. I, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to frame it. I, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, I felt a little bit strange that, strange that they put me in the same category as Hashem Yisbarach, but... <laughs> but the physic was priceless. It was, pr it, and, and it came with the perfect moment. Yeah. It really did. Wow. You know what? You're giving me strength now. Because there are times, you know, we all have low times, you know... I always tell people I was a physician. Before walking into the operating room, I can tell you what my results would be. Today, anything but. And it's, it's very difficult because you know that the closing rate here is so small compared to any other vocation. Yeah. It requires 
such self motivation, you saw, to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Every day, every single day. And what's interesting is I know that there's a, and, and I'm not I'm not generalizing or stereotyping, but I know that a lot of women, there's a, they have intuition. I, I'm not somebody who's intuitive. I can't tell okay. you, I feel this match. For me, it's all about data. I have to put two people in front of me. I use a, a systems and data to be able to make a match. So I, and, and I think that that's being a man. I mean, again, I'm sorry that I'm stereotyping, but being a man in this world, I, I have no choice but to use whatever resources that we have that we can use. Because where a lot of women would say, oh, you should, you, you should date them. I just feel like it's the right thing. I, I can't say that. Right. That's how a man's mind is assembled. I had that last week with an older 50s guy. He wants to get married desperately, a mid-40s girl. So she says to me, so what made you think about putting us two together? I said, simple. I looked at the hashkafa. You are aligned in terms of life attitude, and that's it. You know, she's like, what, how else can I approach it? Exactly like you said. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, I like to use my, my secret sauce is the big five personality traits. Alfred yeah. Adler's work, uh, it's unbelievable. And if I, that's really my secret sauce to matchmaking. Because- Explain it to us, share it with us. So it, it, the first thing is that in, in, in Judaism, we truly believe that a couple is two halves of a single whole. I know it's in Kabbalah and it's in Hasidus and, and there's a lot of conversation about it. But more than that, we truly believe that. So if you're two, two halves of a single whole, what does that whole unit look like? Well, we know what it looks like on a spiritual level, but do we know what it looks like on a more metaphysical or, or emotional level? And I think Alfred Adler has these big five personality types. And you can take a look at it. Anyone who doesn't know about them, I encourage you to, to look it up. It, it's all over the place now. And you can actually take a free test, big5-test.com. I don't get anything for it. <laughs> this is it's a great free test and i actually have anyone who i'm setting up automatically the first thing i say to them is take that test because it gives me so much data on them and so basically the big five is i mean it's it's extroversion introversion again it's a spectrum right it's not just uh you know you're, you're not an extrovert or an introvert the, the the that particular um the spectrum is zero to 120 where the baseline is 60. So you, you could be more introverted or extroverted, but we want to know, for example. So you can imagine I'm uh, definitely not an introvert. <laughs> not a question. No. I, actually score, I actually score on the big five, and I'm curious, <laughs> I'm curious, Jack, where you score. But uh, I score on the big five at 119 out of 120. Wow. Extroverted. Valedictorian. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, no. Not necessarily. It means I'm I'm an extreme extrovert. Right. So you're out, out on the end of the spectrum. So here's the thing. If I want someone more extroverted than me, I have only have one point out of 120 that I can get to if I want to find someone more extroverted. So the odds are the person that I am going to well who I married is less extroverted than me. It's Absolutely. a reality. So Absolutely. that makes us two halves of a whole. Now, how less extroverted than me is the question. That gap between us is going to be the source of a lot of our conflict. As an example, this, this is one of five, but the, the gap between us will be the source of a lot of our conflict. So I don't know if I could marry somebody who's a 20, who's, on, who's extreme introvert, or who's a, a one, if I'm a 119, who goes a one, but, I, but there's a lot of space there. I could marry someone who's a 117, a 16, a 115, even somebody who's an 80 or 90 who's still extroverted, but, but not, still not as extreme as me. So right. the, the single half of a whole is once you see that data, the question you ask yourself is, which side do I want my partner to be on? If you're in the middle, if you're an ambivert, then you can say, do I want an introvert? Do I want an extrovert? If you're an extrovert, yeah, you can yeah, say, do I want someone option. more extroverted or someone less mm -hmm. extroverted? There's another one, uh, another one of the five. Openness, open or closed to new experiences. There are, are people who like routine. Yeah. They like everything the yekis. same. The yekis, the yekis, exactly. And then there are people who are adventurous. They want everything yeah. different. They don't want to go to the same restaurants. They don't want to do the same thing. Now, the relationship is going to ask for both of those things. 
the relationship as a whole, this is, this is my fiddish. The relationship as a whole is going to want both the person who's open, more open to experience, and the person who likes more routine, who's less open to new experience. That's the reality. So if you're someone who's more open to experience, the relationship will be asking you for someone that is more routine based. Got it. It's just the reality. Okay. Again, it's so the relationship exists as a whole. Your right. have is someone open to experience, or your have is the yakka who's more routine. Okay, now you know as a matchmaker, I know right away what I have to look for. I have to look for someone who's more adventurous because you're a yakka. Because you're someone who likes routine. Got it. Beautiful. Next, um, someone who's 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 more emotional. You know, there, there's words they use for it, but I don't like those words because they're negative words. They're the scientific words. But somebody who's more emotional, somebody who's more intellectual. That's, you know, a relationship needs somebody who's emotional and somebody who's intellectual. So if you are someone who's more emotional, automatically you're going to score a certain. The, the word is neuroticism. I don't like that term because yeah. the negative, negative term. Negative connotation. It's, it's a sec, It's a scientific term, which right. Right. So, so, but but if, but I'll say someone who's more emotional, which is a wonderful trait to have for a relationship relationships thrive on positive emotions but we'll need someone that is more what they call stable which is more intellectual I, again I, it, I i don't like that scientific term but more intellectual that's the two halves of a whole and and, and there's others and that's kind, and just using that alone just those five things you and, and you can look them up already gives us an idea if you're on one side what kind of person you're looking for. Now, when somebody comes to me and says, this is what I want, that's not interesting to me because I don't really care what you want. Right. Because everything, because if only, we always say, if only the singles knew what they really wanted, then they would that's have That's just media-driven instructions. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we see that all the time. I always try to differentiate between needs and wants. Exactly. Wants are superficial and needs are what you really need to be asked. Exactly. Very important. Yeah. So, right. What I tell you a very interesting you. story. Yeah. That you know, I'm a physician. I got a, I got a call from a, a lawyer who I deal with in healthcare. Because I'm going to ask you another question. I'm going to tie it in. Do you think that we date with our heads or our hearts? And obviously, we date with our heads. He's a guy from Buffalo who came into Manhattan and flew in on JetBlue, and then he had to go back after the hearing in Manhattan to JetBlue and JFK back to his hometown in Buffalo. And when he gets to the terminal, they tell him, Mr. Feldman, your flight is delayed. Why don't you go over to the TWA hotel? He walks in there and he tells me, Jack, you know what I see? A hundred Orthodox couples dating. What's that all about? What's going on over there? So I said to him, Matthew, that's real that's, dating. The it's real dating. Exactly. That's real dating. I was sitting there with my wife and we were just like people watching and saying, yay, nay, yay, nay. It's terrible. We're terrible. It's, it's awful. You should not do that. You should not go to a TWA hotel and start going yay, nay over there. <laughs> exactly. You know, they're, they're focused on determining what are your values, where are your goals, where are you going, what's your direction in life. You know, some of, one of the nicest things that I ever saw was by a French philosopher that love isn't two people staring at each other. Love is two people staring out in the same direction. Oh, I love that. Isn't that I isn't love nice? That. This is a great, great quote. Yeah. Great. I'll be going in the same direction. You have to, you're driving the car and you, is the passenger seat occupied by someone going in the same direction? Which, same leads, direction. Us to, which leads us to another very important thing. What's more yeah. important, the past or the present and future? I would like to say it's the present and future and the past is not as important. When you're dating. Absolutely. 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 Um, so I want to get your take on, on something. It's a little provocative, but I'm getting a lot more of this lately. And um, perhaps if I can quote it carefully. It's not necessary to take a test drive in order to find out if a couple is physically compatible. I'm getting a lot of this lately. And I'm trying to get, get I see their problems because they run to the final uh, chapter of the book, and they're getting themselves into a lot of issues. And you said about thinking future. So I'm dealing with a couple right now, for example. I'm trying to clamp that stuff down. You understand? Right. Because they, I said, you're living in the Olam you're living in the world of fantasy. Because you're constantly 
use that tool, you can't, uh, you can't neutrally and objectively work on the relationship and deal with the issues that are concerned. How, how, how do you deal with that? What do you, how do you, how do you try to lead a couple to, to realize that, that that just clouds judgment? So sorry to put you in a tough corner. It's, it's, it's yes, a tough corner, but also there's a realistic element. We have to, most couples today, most singles today, most individuals today have a clouded judgment when it comes to physical attraction because they are exposed. We are a Correct. generation that is exposed to much more than any of our predecessors. And so I think that an individual has to check themselves and say, am I unrealistic because of my exposure? And if that's right. the case, then physical attraction, it doesn't matter. What, what I was saying before is that we have to look at, when a single comes to me and says, this is what I want, my first question to them is, what do you have to give? I don't ah. want to know what you want. I want to know what you have to give. And so if, if the person you want and the person you are and what you have to give, if you can put them on two pieces of paper, and they can go side by side. Right. And you can say, yeah, these two people can be married. Then that makes sense. That makes complete sense. But what you want to ask yourself, you see, what happens is people are saying, oh, well, you know, especially because pictures. I don't look good in a picture. I don't look good in this video. I don't look good in, in any picture. I don't consider that anyone else looks good in pictures either. So you're judging on a picture. You're judging on physical attraction. That's not a fair judgment. And anyway, at the end of the day, it's not either the most important thing that you need for a long lasting and healthy relationship. I always tell people, Israel, it's the lobby to the building. But there's a whole exactly. building to traverse. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's not even what you need for a long lasting and healthy relationship. So if you're looking for a, a, a a relationship that is going to be like the movies, which is two hours, that has a beginning, middle, and end in two hours, then okay, we can talk about physical attraction. But if you're looking for something that's long term, then you want to set something up for success. It's okay. It's, it's okay. Everyone is entitled to their own place, their own opinion, their own experience. But don't clog up the system. Don't think that you're looking for a long term relationship when you're not. And if you are, don't use short-term relationship tactics on a long-term relationship experience. Terrific. Terrific. Uh, I want to share a, a scenario with you, a thought with you, and here, get your take on this. Uh, one of my favorite writers is Gila Mandelson. Fantastic. How this yeah. woman went from zero to 100. I became one of the leading pioneers in Shirat Nigiate. It's amazing. She brings down a very interesting thought, and I want to you your take on this, because I had a brother-sister combination come in last week, 41 not married, guy, 38 not married, girl. Okay, um, and I read them the following uh, scenario that she brings down, she's a therapist. She says, I once met the perfect couple, Larry and Linda. They agreed on everything, diet, politics, travel, music, echo green, the environment, the works. They were an enviable couple. Larry and Linda are now divorced. What happened? She continues, she says, Larry and Linda missed the boat on one thing. They didn't realize that marriage is a spiritual path. And as a result of being a spiritual path, you have to have the concept of self-growth. Because there was no spirituality in their life, Larry only cared about Larry. Linda only cared about Linda. And the marriage dissolved. Absolutely. And when I saw this brother-sister combination last week, I said, let me hear. I always probe Yiddish guy because I believe that... Deep down, as much as Hashem wants us to help them in their dating, but we gotta get God into this picture because we need His intervention and we need His bracha. We need blessing. Now, it could be little, it could be little, it could be incremental. But I want to see if I can get you to move a little bit. You understand? And I spoke to them. I said they don't eat kosher, they don't keep Shabbos. And I said it's fine, but let's start making some incremental movement because then. You get God involved, and that means a lot. Because I, I'm a huge believer. I totally agree with her. That marriage is a spiritual path, and that can be defined in any way you want it to be defined. 
on what level you want, but I want your take on spirituality or spiritual involvement in a relationship. I, I think there's a deeper elements here in, in your scenario. You have two people, individuals are fluid. We're not stagnant. Absolutely. Which means we're not gonna stay the same. So either we're gonna grow together or we're gonna grow apart. So what, what happens under the chuppah as a rabbi, and I have the great privilege of presiding over many, many chuppahs, as I'm assuming you do as well. Sure. As a rabbi, I find that we are the first line of defense. So if a couple comes to me and asks me to marry them, I ask them the first question, how many dress fittings are you going for? They're like, Rabbi, why are you asking that question? How many dress fittings? I say, because as many dress fittings as you go for, that's how many rabbi fittings you have to go for. <laughs> that's right. I, my job is to set you up for a long lasting and healthy relationship. I want you to have a toolbox. I want to stand under the chuppah. I want to look at that cup of wine in my hand and I want to be able to make a blessing on your union, a real blessing. And if I didn't do everything in my power to set you up for a long lasting and healthy relationship, I have no right to make that blessing. It's a brachal of Atala. It's a blessing in vain. That's why the divorce rate is over 50% right now. And how? And, and, and it's my job as a rabbi, it's our job as a rabbi to set a couple up for long lasting and happy and healthy re relationships. Just giving a toolbox. Just for me, I would say the most important thing is learn how to communicate, learn how to fight. Every couple fights different. Just learn how to fight. Absolutely. Right. Agree to disagree. Absolutely. So yeah. generally a couple that I will be presiding over the wedding, I will meet somewhere between seven to 15 times with them before they get married. Set them up for the right path. Absolutely. So what's happening is we think that the, the chuppah, that the marriage is the end. Finally, we did it. We spent so much time getting to this point that we think that's it. No, that's the beginning. And it's so easy. Most divorces, according to this, the, the research, most divorces are happening between 18 and, and 30 months. So it's they're happening early. Yeah. They're, they're happening early on in the relationship, often because it's really easy to grow apart. So the spirituality needs to be, in a way, you can call it spirituality, you can call it metaphysical, you can call it a higher power, however you call it. It needs to be done in a way that the two of you are growing together and you have the same trajectory, which is why if somebody asks me, if you have the same background, the same past, or you're going in the same trajectory, I would say the same trajectory is more important. The future, the present and the future is much more important. A thousand percent, right? Are we going Kadima yeah. in a forward manner? That's the key. As much as what was, was. We don't, fo we don't focus on that. So I'm not it's surprised so about, I think Larry and Nancy, I don't remember who, what their names were exactly, but I'm not surprised about a couple growing apart because it takes work and efforts to grow together. Yes. And yes. if you don't have the tools, then you can't expect a couple to be able to grow to, to, to grow together. And things come up very quickly. And the relationship also changes. There's a relationship that's the honeymoon period. And then, God willing, there's a child that comes along that changes the relationship completely. And then as life goes on and we take on particular stresses, uh, homes, uh, lives, uh, various things that happen, come what may in a relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to share a, a Dvar Torah that I just saw this morning with you, and I, I loved it. And it said that when it came to the first tablets, Hashem made them. Had they never been destroyed or broken by Moshe, life would have been angelic. If any, it would have been like the Garden of Eden. The second tablets, we know God didn't make. Hashem said to Moshe, you go carve them out yourself. And they were made by men. As a result, man now has to sweat. Adam Hamal Yulah. Exactly. Man was made to, now has to exert has to exert his, his efforts in his marriage, he or she, or NASA, raising children. That's what life's about. If you take your eye off the screen, off the windshield, you have problems. Yeah. You have to constantly focus. And like you said, constantly invest into that marriage. It's so very important. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I remember early on in our relationship, and again, Sarah and I, we got married very young, and uh, we didn't have the right tools. Nobody set us up for, with the right tools. And somebody was saying, well, how often do you go on date night? And I said, well, what's date night? 
I never even heard of it. What's date night? Oh, what do you mean you don't know what date night is? You go together, you have to date each other when you're married. So we dated already. What are you talking about date night? We already did that. So we're done. We we're over with that. That was hard enough. I don't want to remember it. And uh, somebody said, but you, ha you have to do that. You have to find time to be able to focus on one another. And I think that it seems like such a simple idea. Like, of course. But it's not, of course. It has to be something that the same way that you and I carved out this appointment in our schedule. Right. For 9 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday night, there has to be that level of carving out an appointment in the schedule. This is appointment. I'm not doing anything else right now. I'm not answering an email. I'm not looking. My entire attention is focused on you. That's what date night has to be, exactly what we're doing right now. I got to share something amazing that my wife just shared with me. The 777 rule. Every seven days, go out, date night. Every seven weeks, a night getaway. Every seven months, a double, at least two day getaway. No way. Oh, yeah. I thought it was wild. I loved it. Okay, I don't know. Seven, seven, seven. For young couples, that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot to ask. Go on. Uh, Probably could be also a little saying if they love this. Okay, so if you're able to do it, I love it too. I think seven, yeah. seven, seven. <laughs> could be seven, seven, seven. seven would have been nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but you, maybe it ends up becoming seven, seven, zero because it's this. It's what ends up happening is you have the every seven days of date night, and then you have every seven weeks, and then after <laughs> that, it goes back. <laughs> the zero it's easy to get the zero two days who can imagine taking out two days <laughs> very nice nice i want to share a scenario with you about a young woman who told me that she's a little upset they're dating a while um and the man doesn't step it up and take charge and be the confident guy that led me to thinking that i know i have to i had a session with him and i, I decided to pull out an article that i'm in love with it's an interview of Marcus Friedman many years ago for Tuba Al for Army Magazine. And there, he talks about a, 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 a theory that I became very comfortable with. I was the Talmud of Rav Shalom Manush for nine years. I spent nine years in Uman with him from the early days. Wow. And he brought us something, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, because Rav Manus Friedman is hard on his too, and I'm a very big believer. The man is the mashpia, the man is the giver, and the woman is the receiver. And along with that comes, he says, what's Mashpia responsible? Like this woman was telling me, she's tired of making the plans for the dating. I said, that's not right. I got to get on this guy's case. I thought he has to step it up. And I backed it up and I showed him, John Gray writes the same thing. There are three qualities that a woman needs to see in a man to be attracted to him. Confidence, man with the plan and responsibility. What's your, what's your thought process about this? If you do, if you about the man being the mashpia, the giver, and the woman being the receiver? We have no choice on this conversation to be generalizing. If, 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 we were, if the two of us were talking to an individual, it would be a different story, but we have no choice but to generalize. So right. that statement is a generalizing statement. It doesn't always apply to every situation. Okay. And there's different situations that I've found, and I'm sure you as well, that this does not apply to. But generally yes. speaking, Women are by nature relationship beings. Right. They're by nature. Men by nature, again, we're generalizing here. Men by nature are not relationship beings, which I think that's why this statement is so important. Because the same effort, the toil, what it takes to make a relationship work, women by nature, again, generalizing, have that. They have right. that. You have to they're assembled they are, that way. They're, 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 their makeup is set up that way. Yeah, they're assembled it's, that way. That's their their way down. And yeah. I can tell you, as somebody as a, who, who's male, who deals in relationships all day, I have to learn everything. Nothing is intuitive. I have to look at, I, I have stacks and stacks of research. All the reason I have, I have an, a very expensive uh, uh, a subscription to academia.edu, and every single new research that comes out of relationships, I'm automatically looking, I've got either I have it on my Kindle or I have it downloaded on Shabbos. I've got stacks and stacks of research <laughs> because I, it's nothing it's intuitive. I have to learn it all. So I'm learning Absolutely. the data. And so sure. that's why the man's job is to look for the woman. That's why the man has to go and, and be the provider and has to be the one who, the, you know, women, again, again, this doesn't always apply, but often, if the man is not out there looking, he's doing something wrong if he's single. And if he's 
then that translates that into marriage. If he's married, if he's out there and he's not making an effort in the relationship, he's doing something wrong because it's not intuitive. I, I love, love and I, 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 I have to, everything goes back to Fiddler on the Roof at the end of the day. I'll tell you something funny. I'm gonna hear. I never saw, I have, I've never, I, 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 until about three months ago, I used to say, my, my claim to fame was, I never saw Fiddler on the Roof. I know it, it's part of popular culture in the, in the United States today and in the world today, but I never saw it. Somebody in my community <laughs> sat me down and said, you, you've been talking about this for 20 years it's that you never saw it. New you time, my time. Okay. Yeah. I'm not gonna, I mean, he, he, he actually, now he, now he jokes about it. The rabbi got through 15 minutes of it before he fell asleep, but <laughs> I, I did see it. I, I officially, by, by osmosis, by proxy, I saw it because I was sitting in front of it, though I was sleeping most of the time. But there's this, there's this one really poignant moment where Goldie turns to Tevya. I'm oh, sorry, Tevya turns to Goldie and says, do you yeah. love me? Love me, right. And yeah. she says, do I love you? I shine your shoes and I wash your clothes and I do make your food and da 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 da. And, and what she's really saying in that is that, of course, of course, because my makeup, the way I'm designed is to provide, is to be there for you. You, you on the other hand, you can be married to me for 30 years and have an existential question. I have a couple sitting in my office today. She goes out to the bathroom. He, he turns to me and he says, Rabbi, I just want to know, do you think we're soulmates? <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> this happened today. Wow. Think, off, hot off the press. Do you think we're soulmates? And I said, of course you're soulmates. How do you know? How do you know? Because I was at your wedding. When you front of the chuppah, you became soulmates. Right. Till further notice. You can have many soulmates. Over your, over your lifetime, just not at the same time. Right. But the moment you smashed that glass and we said Mazel Tov, you became soulmates. That's how I know. But what about, Bastard. what about Basharat and all these things? I don't know about Basharat. I see two people in front of me, that's Basharat. You're together. You that is like Basharat. What you've done, that's, that's yeah. Basharat. Now you what's in front of us. It, Absolutely. Yeah. The wrong time to ask existential questions is once you're married. Once you're married, so I agree with this idea of giving. Once you're married, your job is giving. Now I wanna talk about giving a second. One of the most amazing pieces of research I ever read on relationships had to do with the Obama campaign. It's here. And I'll, I'll explain it. At, during the Obama campaign, they did something brilliant. The average donation to the campaign was six dollars. Did you know that? The it's average donation. Small. Wow. They, okay. they, that was intentional because they knew that the moment somebody gave them a dollar, all they needed to do is give them a dollar. They would probably go out and vote for him. Because wow. and this is an old that sent into motion a certain psychological response. Exactly. And actually this is very deep within the Jewish within Jewish tradition, within our tradition. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. Giving creates love. Without, but that's the very word. Have the core of Abba means to give. It's have. It's right. to give. That giving right. creates love. And they proved it. They proved it. Because all you had to do is give Obama a dollar, and the odds are you probably voted for him. And, that, and they showed it. That, that, that was that the whole brilliant. entire campaign. That's brilliant. And, yeah. then, and today, there, 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 there's there's... there's Many studies that have been done on this on, on, on this type of politics. No one's done it successfully since him. Fascinating. He was able to build a cadre of followers simply by touching and that button, John, pushing that button. Give me a dollar. Right. That was their whole campaign. To give, right. give us a dollar. Giving means connecting That's to me right. and bend. Right. So if you're having trouble connecting with your spouse, give. A little more. Yes. Absolutely. It's because you're not giving. Two people who are growing apart, that question you asked before, it's because they're not giving enough. If you're worried, is she my soulmate? 
You need to give more. You know, he writes in the article from Manus, he writes in the article later, what you've seen today in marriage consultations, in Shalom Bai's consultations, you know, preparing marriage. He says, a common theme again and again is today, 2022, selfishness, selfishness, a lot of that. And that's what we need to secure. Like you're, you're giving us the antidote to that. If you're worried there's something wrong in your relationship, you're probably not giving enough. So many couples come, they're sitting in front of me, but she doesn't do this for me. He doesn't do this for me. She doesn't do this. Whoa, 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 whoa. We, we, in, the single, when, if you're single and you come to me, I want to know what you're giving. If you're married right. and you come to me, I want to know what, what you're giving. What are you bringing to the table? What are you bringing? It's not about what others have to do for you. <laughs> that, that, that narcissism that's plagued yeah. our society has, has, no, your job, your job in the relationship is to give. What can I give? Oh, you didn't. Oh, but I'm giving and I'm not receiving. You missed the whole point. Giving creates love. Right. Absolutely. I often tell people when they come to me for this issue, I say, you started your life under the chuppah as givers. And then suddenly, like a few years later, it becomes, and then I'm nearly, nearly. If I'm not looking out for myself, then what am I? Now the transformation is taking place and you're forgetting the rest of the verse, the Pasuk. If you're only for me, what are you? That's right. right. The world is created for me. No, the world is created for you to be a giver, to take the blessings and the talents that God gave you and share it with others. And, and I tell them, from the Torah's perspective, how do you define how great you are? Not by how much you have in the bank. It's about how big your, your ani is, your eye. If your eye is you alone, you're rather small from the Torah's perspective. As you care for more people and your umbrella grows and your radius grows, from the Torah's perspective, you're greater and greater and greater. A person like the Bab Chirabi, his Ani was extraordinary. It was over the universe because his caring for others was the whole world. So it's like, well, it's, it's, it keeps in tandem what we're saying. The English language has an eye disease. Yeah. The only letter in the English language is always capitalized as the eye. It's, it's an eye disease. Yeah, and not, it's, not only that, but if you want to have a humble day and you want to practice humility, you say, all my emails today, I'm going to do lowercase eyes. You press space bar and you know what happens? It That's auto capitalizes up. it. Yeah, it's all about Oh, you that think you're humble? We're going to show you. Wow. It's a good lesson. It's a very good lesson. Wow, wow, wow. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> good stuff. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about, I know you're into technology. Uh, one of my clients sent me a article. I thought it was fascinating. AI. AI. I know you've been doing some research on that. And it was a, a research analyst who in Canada, her name is Samantha John. You may, if you saw this study, 85 of the world's most renowned scientists joined up to study 12,000 couples and they asked them what they were looking for to see if AI can predict for you who you should marry. And here are their findings. They couldn't predict who you would marry, but they came out with three findings. And I, I wanted to share that with you. And it was three things. John, were you satisfied with your life before you met Sally? Two, John, were you free from depression before you met Sally? Or John, did you have a positive effect on people before you met Sally? Fascinating. Isn't that interesting? Study. I didn't see the study, but it just so happens to be, I was in uh, Pittsburgh this weekend, and yeah. I happened to have a meeting with a couple of people who work in AI and data analysis for Google. Just happened to be sitting oh, wow. there. And we, they, they, they were, we were reminiscing about AI and about ChatGPT. And I said, I, I have an interesting thing I want to I run by you. This is what I said to them. I said, um, I was doing a, a, singles, a, a, a single Shabbaton two weeks ago in Edison, New Jersey. Okay. And, and I'm just about, just um, lately, almost every weekend, uh, I'm, I'm at some Shabbaton. And so- Are you taking the wife with you? Or are you going solo? We try, I try as much as possible. It's hard. It's, it's, it's hard, but I try. It's, it's, it just happens to be, you know, right now. And, and, and we, look, this is our work together. We're, we're doing this, we're, we've dedicated our lives to the Jewish community, and this is our work together. Sure. Sometimes physically be there, and sometimes not. And so, what what we did was we we did a we took a questionnaire 
of every single person coming to the Shabbaton. We threw it into chat GPT and we asked it a number of questions. You have to prompt this very well. And, and uh, like I said, I'm into technology. I, I, I learned proper prompting for, for, for AI. And we asked it, um, we're making, these are the 80 people. We're making tables. Who do you think, think we should put at which table and we why? Should sit and with who? Wow. So we did a speech. I'm hoping you have to say. And it, it analyzed the whole thing. It explained why. And it gave us three different scenarios. Yes. And we chose one of the three scenarios that would work best. What's fascinating is there was 80 people at the Shabbaton, 16 couples are still dating. Wow. From the Shabbaton. Oh, that's cool. Then we asked it, what kind of games, icebreakers, should we do at the Shabbaton based on these personalities? We did a trivia game. We asked ChatGPT, what kind of trivia should we do? Now, usually if you do a trivia game, I mean, I can tell you I've been at a lot of these types of things. You get 10%, 15% if you're lucky. This was, people got 80%. Wow. Anyway, these guys who are working on BARD, they're working in Google, in AI, they said to me, this was the best thing they've ever heard ChatGPT do, ever. That's it, that was they the said, best this is, to date. Because often people are asking it to do things that it wasn't properly designed for. They said, this is the best thing they've ever heard it do. And I can tell you, the proof was that we it really did help and 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 of 80 singles that were at the shabbaton there are 16 couples that are still to the, the two weeks later it's not bad that are still dating at least that's that phenomenal yeah and this work it's phenomenal yeah considering all the uh the randomness in, in what we do and all the different aspects that they can decide not to like each other his nose his car his handkerchief exactly well that's the point see we're two men in this world we're not intuitive by nature. So yeah. that we, we have the opportunity to bring data into this world, right? We're both talking data. You're looking at the science, I'm looking at the science because that is the gift. It's not, it's not by chance, it's not, I didn't feel anything and set somebody up. Oh, the two of you, you'd be perfect together. I've never done that in my life Funny. because I don't have that intuition. But I do, I can look at two profiles and two people and say, I think this is why the two of you, similarities attract. That don't attract. It's a myth. It's similarities that attract. Common things in common. So I can look at people and say, "Look, these are your similarities. These are your personality similarities." Listen, I think it's worth a try. On paper, it looks good. Did you design that intake sheet? Yeah, I designed it. Uh huh. I didn't say I over matchmaking. Don't. Uh, Get a, don't get someone just wrote in the comments. Don't get that idea. But I think that it could. Look, these guys who are who were working at Google said that that particular thing that we did using our obviously our proper prompts was able to help in that particular situ situation. And I do think that there is certain things that AI could do that properly prompted can help the, the matchmaking world. So no, not taking over. We still have to use our intelligence and we still have to use the data. But it's, but not, it's very a tool that can enhance our work. Absolutely. Wow, it's excellent. It'd be wonderful to see this, 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 this specific success over here somehow yeah. growing, to grow. It just, it was just an idea that I had getting ready for that particular Shabbaton and the organizers said, go for it. If you think that it could work, go for it. And I just kind of took a limb on it. And, and, and I mean, it's in, I, I have to use, I have another Shabbaton coming up in a few weeks. And I want to try to see if I can use, you know, so, some more. One, one scenario is not good enough for me. We, we need some more data. <laughs> Got it. Are you together? I know that you travel with Elisa a lot. Are yes. Are the Chabatons always together? Or are you alone? How does that work? So sometimes together, sometimes alone. It happens to be right now, Elisa, you know, riding, she's riding obviously the wave. Thank God we did not think these many months after the show aired that people would still care about it, but it's, uh, it's Tell showing me. and- now, what's going on with that? What's, what's, what's the latest stat? Or, uh, where are you holding right now? with the Netflix movement and the next Netflix uh, wave, the coattail effect? Well, there's definitely, we don't know anything. I mean, they have an option till May of 2025 and thank God, because if there wasn't, the best news is there's no answer now, because if there was an answer now, it would be no, because if they're very No, political. I'm not referring to that oh, so okay. much. If people ask me that, what do you see going on now? What has your life changed as a result of that? Or your your schedule or your your, your involvements. So 
Um, so much, so much. I mean, right after the show came out, I, I, Aliza is an, is an, is one of the, I believe, let's go back up. In Kabbalah, in Hasidus, there's a conversation about the Shekhinah being yes. the type of the Mashiach. I believe that the world needs more female leaders. Okay. The world needs female leadership now. And so seeing that Aliza was catapulted into the spotlight, and we knew this already because we've been working on this for about a year and a half. You know, you, you know because you were on it that the show was filmed sure. a little over a year and a half before it came out. So sure, I remember 2022. Lisa and They're I all about this show for a year and a half. What can we do once the show co comes out? And I said, the best thing we can do is get you in front of people, live people, real people, real humans. We're going to make a live show. And uh, what, what you came to that first night, that was like a reunion. That was like a first try. We didn't know what we were going to do, but we knew that it had to be something that we can get in front of people and people can kind of ride the wave. We thought it would last maybe a one or two or three months at most. We do like three tours and that would be great. Do maybe 20. The, the goal originally was 27 cities. We'll go to 27 cities and we'll see if we can get in front of people and kind of the idea was we believe that every single human should be a matchmaker. Everyone. The only way to do it, everyone. Most matches do not happen from matchmakers. Sorry that uh, we, we, we can burst that's each other's problem. bubbles. That's Most reality. happen from the aunt, the uncle, the, the best friend, the cashier. Exactly. So because most happen from friends, there's so many people who want to match people up, but they don't know how. So the idea became, let's do live matchmaking. We'll get singles up on stage. We will have the audience it's asked questions and then Elisa will say this is a good question this is not a good question and through that back and forth between the audience and Elisa and the singles that they would actually learn the basics of how to make a match that was the idea behind it we said we'll do 27 cities well we just visited the 53rd city wow and and that includes right now it's 53 cities in eight countries um, all over the entire US most states i mean it's been unbelievable and and the response has been incredible incredible people coming out to be able to learn the basics of matchmaking and people leaving saying oh i could do that right they're empowered and elisa says every single time you are now part of my matchmaking team you are now a matchmaker you do it go say Set somebody up. And even the, the singles on stage, they all, it's amazing. I mean, to see what, you, what, what we do is, you know, she'll, after we, we get to know all these singles on stage, so she'll say, if anybody has an idea, raise your hand. And you have all these people raising their hands, and all these singles never saw so many suggestions. And you see right afterwards, they're sitting up on stage, people standing up, they're getting their number, making suggestions, real suggestions for people. It's unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. unbelievable. Crazy. Wow. We need we need the world to realize yes we need everyone has to be now everyone. pulled in it's we not you need, oh, you're a match i maker. couldn't agree with you more people will, there's a shortage people come to me all the time but like and, and elisa gets it all the time you know you are the messiah you are gonna find me my match you the, are the greatest thing that ever happened since sliced challah you're gonna get me married <laughs> no you you probably have a mystery in your history you know what gottman I, I, I obviously the, the John and Julie Gottman, their research is part of none on, on, on relationships. One of the things that came out in one of their recent studies is that by the time somebody's 35, they will have dated three people they could have married. A thousand percent. And so, you know, it's very interesting. So, so we create. I'll go even farther. I, I, the Tom is of two great giants, and they're both different, but they're both somewhat similar. Victor Miller, when I was 12. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The Rigdon Miller saw an older Bach, an older young man in his 30s, one day on the street. He goes, What's doing with you? He says, Rebbe, it's not clicking. So he says to him, How many, guys, how many girls have you gone out with? Probably about 150. And the rabbi looks at him and goes, I probably would have been married to, yeah, I probably would have been married to 30 of them by now if I was you. So then he says to him, But it's not clicking. So this is the brilliant line. So dear, my dear young man, fix your clicker. 
<laughs> That's great. That's great. You're right. But I'll continue with your comment about he could have been married to three. When I saw this research, I said, if that's the case, then we have to start going back into singles histories and find out if there's somebody out there that they could have married that maybe is still available. Just wasn't the right time. In, in Judaism, we believe in timing. We sanctify time, not space. Right. So we believe in the, the right time, right time. All the time. Time. It's all my thoughts from all my life, right? Everything at its exactly. right time, how good it is. Exactly. So sometimes it could be the right person, wrong time. So let's go back in the history. Let's find that person and let's go find them. And it's become, it's a very successful tool for finding. Go back into your history and see there could be somebody out there for you. That's right. We, we call it, we, we have a little, we have a little form that we created called mystery in your history. Right. But you know what happens there? And I was discussing this in a, in a share last night. Ego is the enemy. <laughs> I had this today with a 42 year old guy who comes once a week. We're trying to find matches for him. A girl came up, I dated her already. So maybe, that, how, how old do I? Seven, eight years ago. So let's try it again. I don't know. It's ego. Will you bend your ego to look at it again? Like you, you said, everything is about time. Yeah. Maybe we can make it work. Yeah. It's such an important part of, of, of relationships. And, and, and so if it could be somebody in your past, it could be somebody you know, it could be a friend. So many, so often I, I, set, I, I, I have a suggestion. And, oh, I know them already. Really? What's their favorite color? Great. So because you saw them yeah. on the other side of the room at an event for, you didn't even speak to them. You saw them at an event or you see them at events. You don't know who they are. You don't know anything about them. That's right. People so there's a bogus line them. that's corrupting, that's toxifying their minds. Yeah. Right. You're right. What's your favorite color? You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Where do they think? <laughs> So you, just, you know them. You, you, I know them. And, and by the way, that's one of the issues I have with speed dating as well, especially in smaller cities. I, I know there's, there, there is, there, there is, there are, there's some, there's some data that shows that speed dating is good. But generally speaking, there's a lot of people who will won't date them. That's it. Oh, I, I dated them for four minutes. Four minutes. What do you find out? Yeah. Oh, four minutes is nothing. What does that tell you about any human being? What does that yeah. mean? Oh, got penetrate. I got to dig. Against all the speed daters, go speed date. But uh, maybe we should reinvent the speed dating. I, I have an idea to reinvent speed dating. How? How? What would you do? With I it? think that everybody has two business cards. One business card is, "Hi, I'm Doctor Rabbi Doctor Jack. You know, I I am a dating coach, and da da da. That's you know, that's who I am, right? I live in in in, in the tri-state area. Da 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 da. And then there's something that's clear you keep close to your heart. Relationships need vulnerability. So you come to the, the speed dating. You come to the speed dating with two business cards. Some people, you're gonna give that business card. Here, this is who I am, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, whatever. And the other one, you can share something vulnerable with. And that alone already starts creating connection. Right. And if you you're willing to let them into your soul, if you're you open a window. Them, share something vulnerable with them. It doesn't have to be, uh, something insane that you never told anyone, but something that's vulnerable, something that, 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 that that's part of your heart. And wouldn't you say that that's a problem when someone comes to you and says, I've been going out, whatever it is, however long, five days, five months, and I'm not feeling it. And I'll, I'll say to them, I don't think you're getting vulnerable. I don't think you're digging deep. It's, it's, it's one date five times. Right. You're really still in your first, first date. You didn't really, you're not in a fifth date. You're on a first date, you just did it five times. Right. That's right. Yeah. You got to be willing to take that risk and dive in and open a window to your soul so they can get to know you. And then they feel the pressure that the connection starts to get built. But it's hard. So when, when the camera first came out, they thought it was capturing the soul. And these singles, unfortunately, have to leave, leave a piece of their soul all over the world with all these people that they're not going to marry. Hopefully, there'll be one they will. But it's very hard. I, I feel the... People say, people used to say matchmaking is the hardest job in the world. I don't agree. Dating is the hardest job in the world. Right. Yeah. They literally leave a piece of their soul with people that, that they may never see again. Right. Strangers that know about your private life now and can share it with others. But that's a necessary evil, if you want to use that word, or necessary requirement. It's not a necessary evil. If you want to even make any effort. It's leading yeah. to a... The problem is when you don't 
know where you're going. So it's not leading anywhere. But if it's leading you to the proper place, then it's the correct thing to do. But relationships right. need vulnerability. They need that vulnerability. And you're going to be, you know, you're going to be dating, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting, well, why isn't it going anywhere? Because you weren't vulnerable. Yeah, that's right. That's right. People are not are not stripping the the labors. They're just they're not letting all this go in here. Very nice. Very very nice. Um, hmm. Let me ask you a question. Oh, I want to ask you. What would you be, What would you take feel on this one? You got to see this one. I didn't make this up. I'm yes. worried. 50, 50, 50 plus year old guy comes in with three type phases of what he wants in a, in a woman. Would you believe this? It's insane. Hold on a second. And you wonder what's going on today. This is crazy. Yeah. Three type pages. Of what he wants in a woman. What this is say, absolutely the first insane. Thing I would say to him yeah. is here are three blank papers. I want to know who you you are and what you have to give to the relationship. Make sure there's three papers worth. <laughs> You're gonna match what you, you want in a woman. If you have three pages about what you want, I want three pages about who you are and what you have to give. Absolutely, absolutely, very nice. Oh, very nice. And lastly, I want to ask you um, the whole concept of physical attraction. And actually, I'll read you something, and I want your take on this. You know, John Gray writes that uh, physical chemistry alone is short-lived. I was amazed that as a counselor when I was working in Hollywood, women who were extremely attractive or looked like models and movie stars, and in some cases were, all shared the same complaint with me. Their husbands were not actually attracted to them. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't imagine any available man not being attracted to these women. Now, I gave it some thought, and I realized why. They were pursued by men who are primarily sexually attracted to them, but never got to know them, which speaks to your vulnerability issue. These men stopped being attracted to their partners, did not betray their women. Both partners were responsible. They put too much emphasis on the physical aspect of the relationship and didn't create the opportunity to get to know and love each other to discover if they were soulmates. When physical chemistry is not backed up by chemistry in the mind and the heart and the soul, it can never last or grow in time. Once the pleasures and passions of the body are experienced, without the corresponding passions of the mind, heart, and soul, physical chemistry would basically dissipate. Physical attraction can be sustained only for a lifetime when it springs from chemistry of the mind, heart, and soul. Concluding thoughts, what do you think about that? I think that Elisa says this so well. Yeah. She says there's a lot of people out there who can be your mate, but a soulmate is a different story. Right. I think there's a lot of you want to mate, no problem. Happy birthday. Go on. Soulmate is someone who the two of you can have a shared purpose and through that shared purpose make the world a better place. Rise higher. Become better. You yourself, you're only half. And sometimes that half, we can't see it because we think we're a whole. And sometimes a single needs to clear out half of their closet sleep on one side of their bed, sit at one chair of their table, feel physically there's something missing in their life. Right. Feel it. There's something missing in my life. Because if you're too full, if you, you know, the, the pandemic had one little silver lining, is that singles who thought they had a life realized it didn't. Right. They had to deal with, so they had to deal with reality. We had to deal with it homes. Is. And it, it, it was home. great. For, for you and I, it was amazing. For a lot of other things it wasn't, but for you and I, it was amazing. Because people right. realize that they really don't, they really need someone. And that, that loneliness is very powerful. But the opposite of that loneliness is togetherness. And the soulmate, the two of you are able to, those souls together are able to rise higher. They're able to do something better in the world. There's a lot of people who can be your mate. But what you're looking for is a soulmate. And not a lot Gamora. of people. Gamora has a great line for it. And I tell this to people, your goal is each soul can go full. That's right. Your life is like your body. We're seamless and we're one. The old, the old story was the, the, the tzaddik of Yushalayim who said, our, our leg hurts. Yes. yes. The doctor. Rabbi Ari Levine. Yeah. What was his name? Rabbi Ari Levine. Rabbi Ari Levine. He went and took his wife to the doctor and he tells the doctor, the doctor asks the question, what's going on? He goes, our foot is hurting. That's the ultimate example of what our goal should be.
euphemism. He wasn't making a joke. He he wasn't, it. it wasn't a nicety about his wife of 65 years. It was right. our foot. He was really in pain because his wife was in pain. Right. Right. You know, you know what they say, when you're having a great time, an hour goes like five minutes. I want to, first of all, express my sincere gratitude to you. It was such fun talking to you. I didn't realize that I had a companion and another male. So we're a small minority, like you said, in a large female-oriented um, you know, vocation. But it was an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight. I hope that I'll have the merit and schuss to talk to you again. And I would be honored to share the dates one day with you. And, and anything we should work together. Absolutely. Really, we connect. I felt a tremendous vibe. Our, we're on the same, we're going the same direction. And our ultimate goal is to do a tikkun for the world, for the, for the Jewish world. The world needs it right now. Jewish homes. The world needs it right now. And, 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 More and than the great thing that you and I could say to anyone is join us. The world yes. needs as many matchmakers as possible. Couldn't agree with you we, more. We never asked but, for this. We just right. stepped up to the plate. That's right. it. It was like thrown in our lap, do something about it or not. And we're people that we have to get things done. I want to wish you health and wealth, bracha, batzlach, and everything you do. Amen. Hashem should bestow upon you material and spiritual bounty. Continue to do your great work. Uh, we should together march speedily. Agree with Hashem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those who bless get blessed in, in return, and double and triple and quadruple. Amen. Thank you, Rizal. Hatzlacha and success in everything. Kol Bye-bye.